Great, so let's get started. <coughs> so my name is Gordon Mackay, and uh, I work for Digital Defense, and we're gonna, uh, I'm going to share a, an InfoSec talk in the form of a murder mystery. Okay, um, any, anyone here play Clue before? Okay, excellent. Um, so let me just introduce myself first. So yeah, I'm Gordon. Uh, I grew up in uh, Montreal, Canada, so not far from here. I know that Boston and Montreal are very, uh, you know, head to head in terms of hockey. Just by the way, I saw the Montreal Canadiens beat the Rangers yesterday. It was an incredible game. Um, just wanted to brag about that. <coughs> this is a great weekend. <coughs> I was on the plane. Um, so I live in San Antonio. I was on the plane uh, coming here. Uh, I guess it was Friday, and uh, so many runners were on. And I'm a runner. Now, lots of runners were, you know, on the plane. I'm like, what is going on? Is it really the Boston Marathon? Of course, I Googled, and there it was. Uh, so great weekend. I'm not going to be running in it because um, I'm going to be drinking later on. So come join me. Anyway, yes, I'm from Montreal, Canada. Uh, I grew up there. I went to McGill University, so kind of friends with Harvard, sort of. Um, and uh, I started working in. Uh, so I'm a, I, I graduated in computer engineering. Um, I started working, I uh, started my career at uh, Bell Northern Research, Nortel, um, doing software engineering, software development for switching, telephony, and it was great. Um, and I thought, hey, if I'm going to do this, uh, where's all the action? And all the telecom action at the time was happening in Dallas, Texas, in the telecom corridor. So I moved my family and myself, of course, to, uh, to Texas, to Dallas, Texas, in uh, very, very late 1995, just after Christmas, started work in, uh, I think it was like January 2nd or 3rd, I can't quite remember, in 1996. And I, uh, I uh, you know, did some call processing, call processing software, platform type software, and stayed there about seven years. Then telecom started going downhill at the time, sort of gradually, and I started looking for a job. I was being laid off. Um, I was given the heads up. And so anyway, I looked around and I found uh, this cybersecurity internet company called Digital Defense, and that's where I still work. I started there in uh, November of 2002. Um, I didn't know much about internet security at the time. I knew a little bit, but they brought me on board mainly for my software architecture skills. Um, and I learned os through osmosis, you know, security. Um, I work with a bunch of pen testers who drink Red Bull and hack into banks and stuff and get paid to do that. I don't know what they do on their off time, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> so they brought me on board to help re-architect uh, a vulnerability management system. So Digital Defense, we offer a vulnerability management system, much like you know Jack was talking about, uh, you know some of the three like Tenable, Rapid7, you know Qualys, Tripwire. Digital Defense, um, we offer a vulnerability management system. We architected it ourselves. We have three patents on it already. Um, so we're, we're one of the best kept secrets in that area. And so when I came on board way back in 2002, I remember I started working, you know, I started really, they threw me right into it right away. And I started working on the existing system, which was very um, immature, if you will. It was not end-tiered. It was like, you know, essentially you had, you had database code right in the web and, you know, it's kind of like two-tiered, I guess. Um, and there was an issue that I started learning about, <coughs> and that's the basis of this talk. And so we came out with a solution for this uh, when we re-architected it. Approximately 2004 was the second incarnation. Um, now we're in our sixth incarnation of this vulnerability management system, and the solution that I'm going to talk about here, or the problem that I'm going to talk about, um, is solved in that incarnation. So anyway, let's move on and let's get to this. So, uh, as far as an overview, I'm going to go over a little bit about Clue, right? Because this talk models Clue, right? So this problem that I'm referring to, I'm not going to tell you about it up front. I'm going to step by step walk you through it. And I'm going to encourage you and invite you to, you know, if, if you figure out what this issue is that I'm referring to, you can raise your hand and say, hey, Gordon, I, I think I know what it is. You can shout it out. And uh, I don't have a prize to give you if you win. But um, you, recognition, right? So recognition is almost as good. So murder mission, we're going to talk about Clue a little bit. We're going to go over a crime scene. We're going to talk about what I call detective tools. Uh, um, we're going to talk about vulnerability management background, because there's a specific scanning methodology that this problem is related to. Um, and then we're going to talk about circumstantial evidence. I will then reveal who done it. 
So, so that's maybe three quarters of the way through the presentation. Uh, talk about the victims, the consequences, and avoiding future crimes. Okay, great. This is the clue board. Does this look familiar? Yep. Great. So clue is a game where you have nine rooms. So the ballroom, conservatory, etc., study room. You have um, a set of cards, actually. You just kind of see them in the corner up there, I guess. That's what these are right here. It's kind of cool. These are rooms, right? So these are the rooms. You also have six weapons. The knife, the lead pipe, the candlestick, etc. And you have six suspects, which are represented by the little playing tokens, the little colored playing tokens that you see here. That's Mrs. Peacock. Here she is. Okay. Mrs. Scarlet, one of my favorite characters. Here she is, right? And so what happens is each player rolls a dice. Uh, up to six players can play. You move around the squares and you enter a room, right? Let me take a step back first. Prior to, prior to all that, the very beginning of the game, one of the players turns, turns the set of weapons around, shuffles them up, right, and then pulls out one. That's the weapon that the suspect use, uses to commit the crime, right? So there's a crime that happened in Clue, and you have to deduce who had committed it, with what weapon, and in what room. So with the suspects, you know, the person shuffles them up, takes one out, places the cards there. Similarly with, with the rooms, uh, take one out and place the rest in there. Now, the person then shuffles up the remainder of the cards and distributes them to the players. Okay, so now you have a set of cards in your hand and you're rolling a dice and you're going around. You enter a room. Each player, when they enter a room, can make a suggestion. And the suggestion is, I suggest, as an example, I suggest that Mrs. Peacock committed the murder uh, with the rope in the billiard room. So you have to suggest the room that you enter in, right? Now, what happens is the player to your, I believe it's left, <clears throat> if they have one of these cards in their hand, if they, have, if they have one of these cards, if they have the billiard room or the rope or Mrs. Peacock, then they can choose to show you whichever one that is. Okay, so it's Mrs. Peacock. So Mrs. Peacock, of course, didn't do it. One of the things I forgot to mention is um, at the very beginning of the game, when you shuffle up the actual crime scene, uh, the play player puts it in the sort of envelope, and that's what that envelope is that you see there, uh, uh, right here, right? So just blowing it up a little bit. There it is, it's placed in the middle. Okay, so, that's, so your goal is to guess what that is, and that's what we're gonna do as we walk through this presentation. So we're gonna talk about an information crime scene. What is this scene that we're going to talk about? OK, well, you know, in the olden days, or quite some time ago, when security was a lot younger, and I was a little younger as well, and you were as well, the different security technologies mainly operated within their own security silo, <clears throat> maybe with the, you know, with the exception of SIM. But essentially, vulnerability management you know, had technology and processes, and it didn't share that information with other technologies. Similarly, uh, DLP, et cetera, right? And then we started to get smarter and we started to say, hey, if we wanna solve sort of more advanced and maybe not even that advanced use cases, we need, to, we need to talk to each other. We need to take this information from the various systems, uh, from the various systems, sorry, let me go back, and share it. And so what I did is I mapped these various technologies, like IAM is uh, Mr. Green, uh, Ms. Scarlet is vulnerability management, etc. One, uh, one of these technologies is actually sharing poisonous data, this is the crime scene, is actually sharing poisonous data into your security ecosystem. And not only is it polluting its own uh, silo, but it's polluting you know, uh, the security technologies that it shares information with. So that in the middle is your CISO drinking poison as a result of it. Um, that's sort of a side effect, unfortunately. So let's take a step back and talk about uh, a security use case. It's a hypothetical use case, uh, but it actually is, could, could be very real to sort of set the stage. So now, please don't go out of, here, uh, out of this room and say, hey, Gordon just revealed a zero day, because that's not the case. It's a hypothetical use case, right? 
But imagine, imagine that uh, we had just been, you know, just today has been revealed the fact that the Apache web server uh, for specific versions, right, so for versions 2.4.0 to 2.4.24, uh, there is a serious vulnerability, um, but it's not impacting the most recent release of 2.4.25. It's fixed in that one magically, okay? What would you do as a security professional to sort of gauge your risk across your network? Well, you'd probably want to consult your vulnerability assessments, right? Hopefully you have a vulnerability assessment program, vulnerability management program. You consult those, or even better, you would launch a more, more, more recent scan, right, maybe even today, across your entire network to determine, okay, which of, my, uh, which of my network elements actually is running Apache at the vulnerable versions. So I'm showing this network diagram here, right, a very small one, where the red dot represents a vulnerable instance of Apache. So there's only one here today. And you'd be, you know, a, a lot of security professionals would say, that's enough to know that. I'll, I'll now just, you know, prioritize this amongst all my other vulnerabilities and throw it into my vulnerability management program and off to the races I go and I'm happy. But if, you know, if you think about it a little bit more, <coughs> it's very possible that although today we know about this zero day, hypothetically, the bad guys and bad girls, for example, um, the hackers, might have known about this for quite some time. And they perhaps might have even compromised us without even knowing it. Maybe they got past their incident response program, if that makes sense. So what you'd do, in addition to you know, looking at the present, is you'd look in the past. You'd say, hey, where perhaps was I vulnerable in the past, where today I'm not? How could that happen? Well, maybe, maybe, you, know, maybe you used to have an Apache, that, a system that was vulnerable, it was installed here in the past, but you deinstalled it, you didn't need it on that server anymore, or perhaps you upgraded to the 2.4.25 and you're not vulnerable. So it's possible that you were vulnerable in the past, but not necessarily today. So this diagram is showing one instance of vulnerable, which is there in the past, but two that were in the past that is not in the present, if that makes sense. You can take that, what I call vulnerability intelligence, feed it into your incident response program as candidates for nodes that are perhaps already compromised. Not to say that they are, but they might be, okay? It's just extra information. So that's pretty cool. So here's where I'm showing <coughs> vulnerability management, and this is at the stage now, you're playing Clue, and you discovered through the process of elimination, going through the board, and you look at your cards, wow, I know that Miss Scarlet is the actual, uh, the actual murderer if that makes sense. You may not know what room it's in, you don't know what weapon, but you know it's Miss Scarlet. So you're proceeding on. So this is a situation where vulnerability management is feeding poisonous information to incident response. Something's gone wrong, okay? Um, so in other words, in the previous diagram where I showed three candidates, three candidates are being shared. Perhaps there's actually more than three candidates but we didn't feed the right information to incident response. So there's some challenge within vulnerability management where the data that we're sharing isn't perfect, if that makes sense, okay? So let's explore more. So this is where we take a step back. I put this on the board because on my next diagram, I talk about time, and every time I think about that, I think about, you know, hey, Marty, right? So we're docs on the board, and, and Back to the Future 2, this is Back to the Future 2, by the way, if you've seen it. So I use these sort of, I guess, diagrams. I you know, kind of fantasize about myself on the board, just like Doc. And so uh, to share a little bit more about this issue, this challenge that vulnerability management, vulnerability scanning has is, the bottom part of the diagram that I'm showing here represents the real world assets, right? The computers that you can touch, even if they're virtual, you know they're there, right? Um, whereas the top part of the diagram illustrates uh, Two different point in time scans. These are, right, so in vulnerability management, you're not just doing one scan at one point in time and finding the vulnerabilities and saying, I'm done, let me go patch, never again look at it. It's a process where you're doing this at regular intervals to understand, oh, new vulnerabilities came out, or what, what did I fix? Did I really fix it? Let me verify that. So you're actually doing vulnerability scans at multiple points in time. Well, one of the challenges is 
how does the vulnerability management system, not necessarily the scanners, but the vulnerability management system, how does it know that a given asset that's been scanned at one point in time is the same as its correct counterpart as scanned at a different point in time? So that's important. In order to satisfy our use case and many other use cases, it needs to be able to do this, okay, if that makes sense. The question is, how does it do this? Right, so to, to understand that, let's look a little more into vulnerability management, vulnerability scanning technologies. I mapped the different weapons of Clue to these, and I'll explain that in a second. But first, let me explain these different technologies. So, uh, there are different scanning technologies and vulnerability scanning land that we all use. There's agent-based, which is up here. There's passive scanning. Not all vendors do that, but some do. Um, it's not up here, but it falls into one of these categories. There's what I call remote unauthenticated based scanning or network scanning, and then uh, credential based or privilege based. So an agent based, um, represented by the rope because it's tied to it, so there's sort of a relation. Um, this is where uh, essentially you'll have your, your vulnerability management system, which perhaps is uh, not necessarily on you know, on your computer, and you'll have agents that are on the computers, they're actually programs that are on the computers that you want to scan. So you have to deploy them somehow. Sometimes that's not hard, but sometimes it's not that easy, right? And so when you run a scan, the centralized vulnerability management system interfaces with that program and says, go launch your scan. And the scan's actually running on the computer, if that makes sense, it's right on it. So it's very accurate because it's present on it. You can get all the files, all the registry keys, lots more. Um, so that's agent-based. Remote unauthenticated, uh, in this case, the scanner has no presence at all on the host that it's scanning. It's remote, um, and it'll send internet messages to those nodes that it's scanning, and based upon the responses, it'll determine, well, first of all, is, is there even a computer there? at the IP address space that I'm maybe scanning, um, what ports are open, what services are there, what applications are present, for example, Apache, what, uh, what vulnerabilities exist, finally, right? So that's remote, unauthenticated-based scanning, or network-based. Credential-based scanning is sort of a, a mixture of the two. The scanning intelligence is remote, uh, but uh, essentially what you do is you go into your your IT system, you set up a, a set of credentials for your various nodes that you want to use privilege scanning with. You enter the vulnerability management system and you provision those credentials. And then the vulnerability scanner will uh, authenticate to the various nodes and then it can get information such as registry keys, files, etc., and draw conclusions. It may even be able to, or can, depending upon the credentials, drop what we call a dissolvable agent or which is a program on the computer. So in that sense, it's very, very similar to agent-based scanning. Okay, um, so it's very, you know, very deep. Uh, but there are challenges or overhead challenges, IT overhead challenges, to actually perform it. In other words, you have to create credentials. You have to maintain those credentials. You don't want them to have too much power. You may not want them to live forever. Maybe you just want to manage it and, you know, sort of in such a way that, okay, I'm just about to launch a scan. Let's, let's enable it. So there's some overhead involved if you want to do it right. Okay, so let's take a step back now. Most organizations, most vendors, first of all, most vulnerability management vendors will offer, uh, they certainly offer the remote unauthenticated one. They may or may not offer agent-based. Um, um, and they typically will offer credential base. So they're going to offer two, two things, maybe three, maybe even four. Passive is in there as well. Um, and essentially, the way that clients will use, uh, use the technology is because unauthenticated or network-based scanning is so, has such low overhead um, and it's quite accurate, even though it's not necessarily on the node, they'll set up recurring scans, maybe monthly, maybe weekly, maybe even continuously, uh, to scan these, the entire network. They'll cast the wide net to get, you know, the, to kind of get the risk and the information across the entire network. And then they'll use agent-based or credential-based for certain situations. Um, we can talk a little bit about that more. For example, laptops where, you know, you know you're actually doing browsing and you have Adobe and, you know, Flash and those types of things. 
Uh, there are certain vulnerabilities that Authenticated cannot detect because they actually don't open ports to do so, but yet they're still remotely exploitable. So if I send you, for example, a Word doc that has a you know, malicious payload, um, even though Word isn't an application that listens on the internet, you, uh, you may still be compromised, right? So you'll use credential-based scanning to detect that. Um, or, for example, if you know where your credit card information is, you have nodes that, or parts of the network which have more risk, you'll want to perhaps get more information. So you'll be willing to spend more money to set up credential-based scanning or agent-based scanning, if that makes sense. Now, I tied the candlestick to remote unauthenticated-based scanning because the candlestick uh, if you look at the various weapons in Clue, the candlestick is the only one that actually sheds light or can shed light. I didn't have a flashlight, so uh, if I did, I would have used it. But, um, so the candlestick sheds light, right? So it's kind of like the scanner sheds light on the nodes that it's scanning. And based upon what it sees remotely with that light, it draws conclusions, okay, if that makes sense. So great. Now. It's at this point in time, I didn't tell you, but the candlestick is actually the weapon, if you haven't guessed it yet, since I spent so much time on it. The candlestick is actually the weapon that's being used here. In other words, it's because of remote network-based unauthenticated scanning that vulnerability management vendors experience this challenge that I'm sharing with you today, which is the subject of our murder. And you may wonder, great, um, specifically, how do vulnerability management vendors, the solution providers, how do they actually track the various endpoints? Remember that diagram that I shared where you had two different scans? How do they track the assets as seen at one point to the correct counterparts as seen as the other, at the other point? Especially when we're talking about remote unauthenticated scanning. Agent-based scanning and credential-based scanning don't have that challenge, and we can talk about why. Um, but let's leave that to the side for now. Remote unauthenticated does have that challenge. And the reason is because if you look at network characteristics for the various elements that are on the internet, there's really nothing, I mean, there's certain characteristics that you would think are quite static, but in reality, they may all change, okay? Um, a lot of people talk, when, when I present this or talk about it, they will say, whoa, what about MAC address? And I'm like, yeah, it's pretty stable, but the problem is, Unless you're deploying scanners on every single network segment, or unless you're talking about Windows, you're not always going to get the MAC address. And so, uh, in fact, one of the largest vendors out there doesn't use MAC address at all to track. And so you may wonder, how do they do it? What do they use? Well, they use various characteristics, such as IP address, various host names, MAC address they do use, um, host types, other things to actually correctly match those things. But most of the vendors out there use only one or two, perhaps three, so they're very limited in, in the, with those algorithms, if that makes sense. Um, actually, this is, this is one of the very, you know, one of the top vendors out there, I'm not gonna name who. This is what they, they actually, I'm, so I'm sharing with you one, one of the prevalent algorithms out there that actually is used to solve this problem. And I call the algorithm, and they call it, for example, they call this, this problem host tracking. So if you Googled host tracking, you know, vulnerability management host tracking, you'll, you'll figure out who it is. <clears throat> and I'm not banging on anybody here, I'm just saying, this, this is, you know, this is real. This is a real problem. And so they use uh, what I call single host tracking key admin user specifies one of. It's a very long name. Um, I'm a software developer and I use very long names in my variables as well, and everyone tells me, what are you doing? Um, but anyway. I digress. So they use one of IP address, DNS hostname, or NetBIOS hostname. In other words, they will allow you to go into the vulnerability management system as, you, as the administrator and provision the system in such a way that you indicate how do you want that, how do you want the vulnerability management system to track hosts across time from you know, different scans? And you can specify, well, you know, I know that I have this, this range here, this IP address range. In this range, I know I have laptops, and it's using the HCP. So I'm not going to use IP address. That would be dumb. I need something else. Let me use NetBIOS. Oh, but this, this is a set of servers in this different IP address. So you can do it by different ranges. 
And you can go in and say, oh, I want this technique for this range, this technique for that range, et cetera. And so that's how they do it. Now, is that good enough? And the question, and that's the question. And to answer whether or not that's good enough, we really have to ask another question. And the other question is, how often do these characteristics change in different IT environments? So my team and I actually did this study about a year and a half ago. That's why we entered the study room. Did this study to find out and understand, well, how often do these things change? And the reason we were wondering about this is because we know that we spent, you know, we have, we have an algorithm, which I'll share, you know, in a little, little while to solve this problem. And, you know, it uses pattern recognition and things like that. I kind of studied that, you know, in my final year at McGill. Um, and so we're spending a lot of money, a lot of money meaning it's special software. It's not like simple, oh, okay, I'll just use this characteristic or that characteristic. It's, it's a lot more complex than that. And when you have software that's semi-complex, you're going to have maintenance as time goes on. Um, more maintenance than if it's simple, meaning you're going to have some bugs. So you're going to have updates. You're going to have to babysit it. You're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to, uh, it's not, it's, it'd be great if you had, could have an algorithm, which is perhaps possible. It's hands off and it's very intelligent and it uses analytics, et cetera. But that's, that's not necessarily, you know, how this works. And so we wanted to understand, well, what are our, what are our competitors doing? And is it worth it? Is it worth it for us to actually spend this extra time if, in fact, IT environments are very static. Because if they're very static, we don't have to spend all that money, if that makes sense. So we did a study. And what we did is we looked across time, and we subdivided this study into different types of devices. Firewalls, servers, laptops and desktops. Um, you know, because they're going to have different rates of change, if that makes sense, based upon different characteristics. Okay? And so, I'm showing you just a cross section. I'm showing you server types host, these are findings, and client type host. Clients meaning laptops and desktops. By the way, here's a reference. I'm sure you could all read that. I'll make the slides available so that it's more easier. But you can go to my website, digitaldefense.com, and just search on resources and you'll find it. Anyway, uh, so for server type host, database servers, web servers, et cetera, application servers, where you would think that, you know, there's, they're not going to change that much. And it's true, there's a very low rate of change, but you know, IP address, which is the default actually on the previous algorithm that I showed you for that large vendor, IP address actually changes at 4% across three months. So if you look at a three month time period, if you have one server, or let's say you have 100,000 servers, 4,000 of them are gonna actually experience at least one change. So we counted one if we saw a change across that three month. Um, and it compounds itself. So after another three months, you're going to see more, more churn, right? So if your algorithms are simplistic, you're going to get things wrong, if that makes sense. So you're probably getting a little understanding of the crime here. So here's where I have a diagram that's actually showing. And I'm map so what I did is I mapped the rooms to the different IP addresses. And so um, in this vulnerability management game that we're playing, which is more than just vulnerability management because we're taking the information and we're feeding it into our security ecosystems in the form of integrations, right, to solve different use cases. This game is actually more complex than Clue because in Clue, the, murders, the murder happens or was committed in one room. But in this game, the rooms change, right? So it's actually multiple rooms, if that makes sense. Uh, so that's that one. So who done it revealed? This is the point in time where I reveal the whole story. Probably guessed it by now, but A, it's the candlestick, which is the weapon. Miss Scarlet is the culprit. And any room you would have picked is cool because it happens in many different rooms. So the reason is most widely used scanning technology in environments. Not to say that the other ones are not used, but I mean, if you're using, if you're doing scanning and you're doing all agent based, then the bravo to you, that's great. Um, similarly with uh, credential base, but most, most, if not all of our clients actually are having troubles doing that because it costs money. And so they, they often use remote uh, network unauthenticated scanning, but that comes with a challenge. Um, and that challenge is solved in different ways by different vendors. In fact, that challenge isn't 
is, is not at the forefront of your minds. Often when I give this talk, by the end of it, people, people come up to me and they say, wow, I didn't even realize that that was a problem. And, you know, it's kind of like you just don't think about it. You just assume that it's, they're just matching perfectly, but that's not the case. And in fact, most vendors use very simplistic algorithms, and I, I was a little surprised at this. Um, and so that's the second point. And thirdly, all remotely discoverable characteristics they're subject to change. So IP address is subject to change. You know, IT personnel, they're not just sitting around doing nothing. They're, you know, things, things drop, printers drop. They just said, oh, I'll just change the IP address and I'll inform the people. You know, so they kind of get around that problem, but they're not thinking, oh, I better, I better not change these things because the vulnerability management system is using this tracking mechanism to track it and, oh, things are going to break, so that's not good. No, they don't think that, right? You have these different teams. And so anyway, that's, that's a big problem. So the real crime here is that vulnerability management systems lack sufficient, what I call, scan-to-scan -scan endpoint correlation. Um, and the result is often they mistake uh, a scanned asset at one, in one point in time to a different one. Or they assume, oh, it must be a new asset. I've never seen this before. Um, so this is the sort of crime revealed. So I open up the envelope. I almost forgot. I have it here. Open it up. And uh, I've got the candlestick, I've got Miss Scarlet here. Obviously, you know that I shuffled them up sort of non-randomly, so, right? And you got the rooms. Anyway, um, for the purpose of the presentation, very good. Let's move on. Consequences. Time check. We're doing good. Okay, consequences. There's actually two different, I mean, there's a lot of sub-consequences, wasted money, etc. But the root cause or consequences of this issue are that the vulnerability management system that you're using will often declare an asset duplication. In other words, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a second, or an asset mismatch. Um, let's talk about asset mismatch, okay? So here's an example. Here's this diagram again, this back to the future diagram, okay? Here's your assets. And over here I scan in week one and I you know, I see three different hosts with various different network characteristics. This is what the scanner is seeing at that point in time. Time progresses. Now let's assume that your IT operations team is doing some work and something happened and they made a change to these two assets and for whatever reason they flipped the IP addresses, okay? Um, this is sort of a very simplified example, but in this situation, what happens is the vulnerability management system, if it's using IP address, if, for example, that large vendor that I was talking about, if, if you didn't know about this problem, you didn't go into the system and specify anything, it's going to be using the default, which is IP address. And even if it were servers, maybe you'd want it to be that way. So anyway, the system, the vulnerability management system will believe that this asset is the same as this one because they have the same IP address. Well, what's going to happen is, let's, so for example, take a step back. Let's assume that this red asset has, you know, a set of vulnerabilities. And the yellow asset has a completely different, you know, it's orthogonal, nothing in common. Yeah, sure, they, they, may, they may both have high-level vulnerabilities, et cetera, but they have nothing in common for the sake of argument, right? So what happens is, after this scan, the vulnerability management system will declare, wow, you fixed all the vulnerabilities that were there before for that red asset. Oh, you got new ones now, but that's okay. You're always going to have new ones here and there, but that, good job. You fixed those. But that's not true. The only reason it's declaring that is because it, it encountered a mismatch. I don't know if you've experienced this, but we've talked to you know, lots of people, not, not necessarily our clients, but prospects that have come to us and, you know, or people come up to me after a presentation and they're like, oh, that's exactly the, the issue I'm experiencing. Thank you for highlighting that. So that's, uh, that's mismatch. Duplication, uh, which I don't have a diagram for, but sort of simplistic, is a case where imagine that at this point in time or later, um, you know, so for example, let's say here uh, you, you, you actually detected this issue. You're, you're like, wow, wait a sec, why is the vulnerability management system telling me that these things are fixed? I know they're still there. And then you, and then you discover, oh, it's because, okay, uh, let me go into the system and actually change this so that it no longer matches an IP address, but instead matches on, let's say, oh, I don't know. Uh, well, I guess it's kind of hard because there isn't anything in this situation, but 
let's use this one, so the red one, uh, DNS host name. I think that's correct. Uh, it looks right. Yeah, we're going to use that. And if it's not, let's assume that it is, right? So I'll use that, right? But then later, let's say um, that's changed. And so now you're in a situation where you have nothing that's common, and the vulnerability management system will detect it at a certain IP address, and it will declare, well, I've never seen this host before, because it doesn't match anything. So it must be a new one. Let me add it to the asset list. So that's duplication. Now you have two hosts which actually have the same information. And you may actually take this, and take this host, prioritize the vulnerabilities, and send it out for remediation, only to discover you know, after work you know, and research, wow, uh, I, don't, I don't even know where that host is. Or, oh, hey, wait a sec. This host belongs to this other team. It's not mine. And so there's actually what I call a lot of chasing ghosts. Right. So victims and impacts. I talked a little bit about this. One of the largest, well, there's a lot of different issues here. But one of them, one of the sort of high level ones is you have in your, you know, in most organizations, the security generals, right? And they're looking at this information and they're making decisions based upon the risk, you know? So if you look at what, what vulnerability management brings us, it brings us a lot of different things, but it also brings us a, a sort of a gauge of what our risk is across our entire network. I'm talking about our actual, you know, network security risk as opposed to other types of risk, right? Well, that information, they want, they're making, a, making decisions based upon it, and often that decision making, although perhaps is correct based, you know, it's correct from an algorithm perspective, it's incorrect because the actual data is not correct, right? So if, so in other words, the, the vulnerability management system is, is a gauge for risk, and that gauge is off because of this issue, right? So that's that. Um, mismatch scanned endpoints, um, right? So um, I had a prospect that come to us and told, uh, told me a story where they were actually like, just as the example before, they were assigning out vulnerabilities. So, so essentially, this is a large organization. They, have, um, they, they were using a different solution at the time. They have a centralized vulnerability management team or a centralized security team that is responsible for vulnerability management. And they have different IT teams that own these assets, right? And so they had a lot of duplication in their asset because of this problem. And they were assigning out vulnerabilities to teams that didn't even know where the assets were because they weren't owned by them. They were owned by a different team. So that's wasting time, right? So lots of other issues there. <coughs> So how do you solve it? Well, this is what we did at Digital Defense. We, um, unlike other vendors where, where they're just taking a few different characteristics uh, simultaneously, in the case of that large vendor that I referred to, they were actually only using one simultaneously. You had a choice of which one out of three, but really you're looking at, uh, you could imagine like, or sort of, you know, the, the analogy I use is imagine your fingerprint where you have all these different ridges, et cetera. Well, wouldn't it be great if you could fingerprint match based upon everything you see? Uh, but what a lot of vendors are doing is they're actually just taking one, one little ridge, one, that you could, one of three that you can choose. Or maybe they have two. Maybe you don't have a choice. Maybe there's two or three. So it's very limiting. Um, why not use everything that you can see? And that's what we do, right? So it's not simple because you have different characteristics that have different weights and, and there's a lot of sort of dependencies, et cetera. But if you could use everything, that's a philosophy, if you could use everything you see, then even though you know, one thing or two things may change across time at certain rates, by and large, if you're looking at everything, you kind of have a semi-static thing that you can use to match these hosts, right? So that's what we do. So the ideal solution, so going back to our mismatch, uh, even though this red host had perhaps changed its IP address, the system should actually, of course, realize that. And this is a simplistic case, but it should match it together. So simple uh, diagram. Murder mystery solved. Thank you very much for helping me with this. Um, so security ecosystems. Uh, the use case, for example, at the very beginning, which is kind of a, you know, it's a cool use case, and there are others. In order to satisfy that, you have to understand, or the, the vulnerability management system has to correctly map the given assets as it sees them 
at different points in time. And those things change, right? Uh, that's the second point. Network endpoints change. Uh, problem is most vulnerability management solutions use one or two characteristics or three, but they don't use all of them, unfortunately. Um, so they're very limiting. Um, how do you solve this? Well, ask your vendor, um, hey, well, how, do you, how do you solve this problem? Um, now that you're sort of more enlightened on it. Um, or, hey, use their API, pull out. So for every scan, you pull out all the data, put it in you know, some place, not necessarily a SIM, um, although perhaps you could. Um, and you correlate this on your own. Now, not easy, but it's doable. And that's what we do. Um, but we do it within the context of the actual bowels of our vulnerability management system. Um, so wonderful. I might be a little bit early, but hey, thank you. And uh, any questions? <laughs>